know it's got an American accent for the recording. No, why? Why? How's that happen? <laughs> oh, so uh, it's really impressive that you you did a a talk before this one and then come came along to this one. Did was was obviously that was online as well. Yes, it was. Yeah. And uh, did they have lots of students coming along? I actually don't know. They might have had a few. It was mostly. Uh, it, 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 there are people that you know I'm familiar with um uh you know the yeah academics. so I, mean, I don't think there were many students this is such a shame really because there's something they could well well maybe not that one but this that one but from this one um yeah there's something that students can take from it I think yes um, especially I mean the stuff that I do is more interdisciplinary so it's not just it's linked to law in my view um I sometimes have a struggle convincing more doctrinal lawyers that it does <laughs> but, um, but that's just the nature of of that um kind of you know existence in law schools um but I think um it's just this that some students get, get a bit lost and they kind of think oh doctrinal law isn't for me well if they come mm. along books like the stuff that I give and some of my colleagues and you and you guys right all of mm, you, mm. It, it's like oh there is something here for me after mm. it, it re- relates to something that seems really important so yeah so unfortunately I don't know but we have that problem at Queen's as well trying to get students to come and it's such a shame mm, mm. yes and I think also like um a lot of um uh students are still kind of feeling their way a little bit but so everyone's um okay so shall we um shall we get started Imogen sorry we're just having a little chat there (laughs) Um, all I can see I can't see everyone else on all the participants I can only say um four of us at the moment but um my name's Jane Kay I'm a professor of health law and policy at the University of Oxford and I'd like to welcome you all to our first seminar in the series uh seminar series for this term um, in our law and technology series and it's um a great pleasure to be able to uh welcome Dr. Mark Fleer from uh, the School of Law at um, Queen's University, Belfast, um, because it's lovely to have you as our first speaker and also to have our first speaker in the first seminar of the year. So it's it's kind of really special and um, really delighted that you've been able to take up our invitation. So Mark is going to talk for approximately 30 minutes or so. We'll we'll give him plenty of latitude there. And then there's an opportunity for people to ask questions. And we really want to keep this, that we really take advantage of the fact that we have Mark with his enormous expertise and knowledge. And so I I really want you to ask questions of him and think of questions to ask him. Because his topic is really cutting edge in as much as he's dealing with the complexity of how, how you think about law and how you think about law and bioethics and so his work is very interdisciplinary and I think that's that's kind of really nice for all of us because these complex issues really need a number of different tools that you use to kind of um, understand them and apply to them. So his talk is understanding expectations as a technique of legitimate Litimation, the case of imagined futures through global bioethics standards for health research. So I just want to tell you that the seminar will be recorded and it will be posted on our Helix website so that um, you can pick it up later if you need be. Um, and if you um, and and so I'm now going to pass it over to Mark. So thank you very much, Mark. Thank you, uh, Jane. And right now, everyone, just give me a second, please. I'm going to try and move uh, uh, that down there so I'm not distracted, um, if you don't mind. Or maybe I should just keep it there because then I don't know if you'll have questions as we go through. I suppose they'll all come at the end. I think uh, I think we'll do questions at the end and I'll okay. ask everybody to mute um, as you're speaking to. Right. I'm going to move the... Uh, pictures then of, of everyone down I don't or maybe I can minimize that can I uh oh I don't know what I'm doing hide thumbnail video right so I'm now hiding thumbnail video everyone 
I hope this works and you don't disappear. <laughs> um, I've turned off emails, so I won't know. <laughs> um, so um, oh, the, the chat's there and all that's still there. So hopefully the host has spotlighted your video for everyone. Lovely. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so thank you very much for the warm and generous introduction, uh, Jane. It's lovely to see you again. And um, yeah, it's lovely to see everyone really. Um, and uh, M M Michael too. Um, um, so let me get on. It is a bit of an odd experience, I have to say, because I'm sat in, well, as you can gather, I'm sat in my office at home and um, the lights have come on um, in Belfast, as I suppose they have elsewhere. It's really dark now. Um, so it's a bit odd when I've got this circle here, <laughs> um, full frontal, so to say. And um, yeah, it's all a bit odd, to be quite honest. Um, it's, a, it's a strange setup, but it's lovely to be able to interact with you and to be able to speak to some of my recent research, which um, comes in the form of really outlining uh, key parts of a recent article that I had published in the Journal of Law and the Biosciences. And so I'll really be speaking to that. How do I move forward? Oh, it's, it's moving. Good. <laughs> um, so I'll, I'll just try and situate my work a bit more. And as Jane mentioned, I'm really interdisciplinary. That's the way I like it. And um, uh, I think there's great value um, to be had in being really interdisciplinary, especially in areas um, within, uh, one might say, health law, um, bioethics, where the issues don't really um, fit or sit very neatly within any one discipline or field. And actually, there's a lot to be bent, uh, there's a lot to be taken to, um, from a variety of disciplines. Um, fields, um, a field such as STS, science and technology study, that I think is of benefit to those working within my home discipline, law, and uh, within that then legal and socio-legal scholars. Now most of my work then, um, I think almost for almost 10 years now, has been trying to combine insights from law, so really socio-legal studies, um, I would say, within law and science and technology studies. Um, and I've been saying a few different things, um, using examples drawn from public health and uh, work on new health technologies, developments in new health technologies. Um, in terms of public health, there's governing public health. That's my monograph. That's my first um, monograph uh, really then about public health at the EU level of governance and drawing upon insights from SDS to try and argue for more citizen participation at the EU level but then by extension uh, within areas where uh, topics seem very technical, dry, uh, without normative content but actually um, contrary to, to how that they tend to be um, described I, in those terms, there's an awful lot of normative content. There's an awful lot of um, normative questions, normative issues within apparently dry and technical areas. Um, most of the people, the academics present today know that very well, but still, um, I think some um, other academics perhaps, and um, perhaps policymakers and uh, so on need convincing. Um, so there's a lot, a lot for lawyers to look at here, and I think in particular by using insights from uh, other disciplines or fields like STS. So my interventions have been in public health and new health technologies. Now, recently, I published a special issue of the Journal of Law and the Biosciences. It was co-edited, a um, special issue with uh, Professor Richard Ashcroft, and now at City, um, actually for a while now, now at City Law School in London. And the special issue was on law, biomedical, techno science, and imaginaries. So the concept of imaginary is really coming from STS and uh, brought into uh, discussion of uh, legal and bioethical issues in order to illuminate um, perhaps some issues we already know about, but in a, in a different light, but also to illuminate perhaps some issues that we haven't really seen before um, within uh, legal and socio-legal studies in particular. Now the first, uh, so the special issue is a first step towards further law-led dialogue between law and STS. Um, 
as such, it takes up uh, the call for law-led dialogue found across socio-legal studies. I'm going to outline this latter call before turning to explain what I mean by or what's meant by imaginaries in that specialist view and to link them to expectations because there is a, a, a link I, I need to make between the two in order to um, give this paper today and um, to summarise my own contribution to that specialist view. And then I'm going to put these concepts to work in respect of global bioethics standards and my own particular contribution then um, to that special issue. Um, so hopefully you'll get to see the use of, that's the intention of uh, using the use of concepts of imaginaries, um, also related concepts um, like hope, expectations and so on um, in law-led work. So within socio-legal studies, in particular, there's a call for further law-led dialogue. Now, um, Annalise Riles is, is one of the key proponents for law-led dialogue. There are others too, Mariana Valverde, for instance, and uh, there's also um, Dave Cowan and um, Dan Wincott, who, who've published a uh, recent edited collection that really calls for more law-led dialogue. I'll, I'll say a bit more. Um, in terms of Riles's own intervention. Um, it's actually highly resonant with imaginaries, which I'm going to, as I say, uh, outline in a, in a few moments. Um, and it's resonant because she calls for more work on, by lawyers and, and socio-legal scholars on legal technicality. So really at the heart of a lot of the work that lawyers tend to do. Uh, she, she, she speaks about how exploring legal technicality is important for the kinds of politics that those interested in law um, want to expose, want to question, um, and in particular the hopes, ambitions, fantasies and daydreams of armies of legal engineers. So hope, ambition and, and these similar kinds of terms, they're future-oriented terms, um, that they are though important to law, to legal technicality, they become encoded in, as one might say, the DNA of law. Now, in the more recent work then, uh, carried out by Dave Cowan and Dan Wincott, um, uh, here underscored then in exploring the legal and socio-legal studies, there's really, I suppose, maybe not a clearer call, but a renewed call for law-led dialogue so Riles is calling for lawyers to really get to grips with legal technicality, to speak to them, to be able to then have something to say uh, in legal uh, terrain, in, in the terrain of law, that really communicates with uh, those in other disciplines and fields that may have been speaking on, on the same terrain or maybe even colonising the, the terrain and um, crowding out discussion by lawyers and, and socio-legal scholars. But then a similar call, um, a similar point is made by Cowan and Wincott, so they're calling for a law-led dialogue, um, actually saying that those working within law and socio-legal scholars um, need to be sensitive to what's going on in other disciplines, how, and fields like STS, um, and how scholars working within other disciplines and fields may actually be writing on, researching on things that are very much central to law, socio-legal studies. Uh, and um, being attentive to that, uh, actually for lawyers and socio-legal scholars to start engaging, to start doing something um, to contribute towards discussion and perhaps um, lead on it. Um, so an example there is, is again technicalities, so that's referencing uh, Ryle, so uh, Cowan and Wincott actually do then um, uh, find inspiration from Ryle's um, and, and then take it forward. Now, I try then in this special issue, which as I said was um, co-edited with Richard Ashcroft, to answer this call. So that's a key uh, contribution of the special issue. And the special issue then, as I said, was to do with uh, law, biomedical technoscience and imaginaries. Now I'm going to turn um, after uh, outlining what I mean by imaginaries here, to my own contribution to that special issue so you can get to see how imaginaries, normal particularly expectations and, uh, and how they produce imaginaries, operates as a technique of legitimation, uh, why that matters, why we should care about that, 
um, how and what um, is illuminated by expectations and imaginaries and therefore the benefit of interdisciplinary uh, exchange between law and uh, STS or I'm not sure what the other word is um, STS is um, the field so but interaction between law and STS is perhaps not interdisciplinary it's into something else um, but in terms of expectations and imaginaries then so this next step before I actually um, put these concepts to work um, in a legal setting um, Jens Becker, who I believe is now the director at the Max Planck Institute, um, has written a, a very good book, um, as one might expect, um, on the imagined futures. And he simply describes them. Um, I'm just going to speed through this a bit more. Um, uh, how expectations are strong beliefs about what will occur and how they produce so-called imagined futures. Now, Jens Becker is uh, writing in the context of economics, I think um, if it's called economic sociology or sociology of economics or something like that. Um, so it's a, it's a more specific um, focus, but broadly economics. That's one understanding of imaginaries. I find this really influential because it seems nice and simple and there's a link there with expectations that's just nice and clear, at least to my mind. When we turn um, to STS, we can see in the work of Sheila Jasanoff in particular, as she works with um, Kim, uh, the idea of socio-technical imaginaries. So there's one article in Minerva. I love that journal, by the way. Um, I think it's so, in, so great in terms of um, the articles in it. I mean, I, I, yeah, I've, I've gleaned a lot from that journal, um, but also from the, uh, the work of Sheila Jasanoff, and in particular, she works with Kim, there's this uh, uh, edited collection there, Dreamscapes of Modernity, where the concept of socio-technical imaginaries is taken forward and developed through a number of chapters. Um, the definition in containing the atom, and so the article in Minerva, of socio-technical imaginaries is as collectively imagined forms of social life, and social order reflected in the design and fulfillment of nation-specific scientific and or technological projects. Now, my own work and contribution to the special issue I've mentioned draws more on Beckert's understanding of imaginaries as simply imagined futures and as produced by expectations. Um, but of course, there's a resonance there with the work of Sheila Jasanoff and her colleagues on socio-technical imaginaries. I suppose I want to say here also that I find simply thinking of imagined futures um, as arising out or as produced by uh, expectations um, a bit more straightforward than uh, the definition of uh, socio-technical imaginaries. There's a bit more thinking to do, I think, um, certainly in my mind, um, on how to use the concept of socio-technical imaginaries. It's a bit more complicated um, than simply um, imagined futures being produced by um, expectations. So I just want to say that. So there is a lot more work to do here. But in terms of putting these concepts to work, expectations and imaginaries, and answering that call then in putting these to work, answering that call for a more law-led dialogue between uh, well, those working within law and socio-legal studies and other disciplines and fields. I do that in relation to this organisation, the so-called, well, I'll just call it ICH for simple, for, for short right now, but I'll, I'll, I'll name it fully in a moment. Um, this is um, its mission, and this is the source of what I'm, what I'm talking about today. I'm going to explain to you, or argue, actually, that this mission has flowing from it expectations that construct an imaginary in particular, flowing from harmonisation for better health. Those, those few words, just four words, but flowing from that are a set of expectations and an imaginary. Um, and there are key implications of those expectations and imaginary um, built into this framing, into this mission statement. Um, key implications that need to be highlighted, um, that give rise to, um, also I think because they're problematic, they're give rise to problems and um, that we need to think about solution uh, solutions to deal with. 
deal with those problems. So the ICH, what does it, what does it stand for? It stands for the International Council on Harmonization of Technical Requirements for Registration of Pharmaceuticals for Human Use. Now, this organization is perhaps rather opaque in legal and socio-legal work, as far as I can make out. Uh, in mainstream medical law, health law literature, um, if it's mentioned at all, it'll just be in a few footnotes, or tend to be in a few footnotes. And there's good reason for that, because um, although its standards are important, and I will, I will speak to those in a moment, um, they do tend to be mentioned uh, almost in passing within legal instruments or as or they form a part of the, they're integrated within um, regulatory processes and so they do seem rather opaque but this organization is important um, and I will explain why but just first of all a little bit of background the ICH was founded in 1999 and uh, 1999 1990 sorry um, at a meeting in Brussels uh, actually at the instigation I believe of the uh, European Association for Pharmaceuticals um, or the pharmaceutical industry but bringing together um, the regulators and uh, the uh, associations uh, for the pharmaceutical industry from uh, what's now the European Union back then it was the European Community um, Japan and the United States. So bringing these together, that's in itself pretty interesting, I think, bringing regulators and industry together um, into an international council on harmonization of technical requirements um, in relation to medicines. Why does this organization matter? Well, it sets global bioethics standards um, in relation to medicinal products. One good example of such a standard is good clinical practice. Um, this is really um, GCP, it's, it's capitalized there for, for, for um, a good reason because um, it is actually a thing. Um, uh, it's, it actually does something. Um, it refers to um, a set of um, technical guidance um, that needs to be followed in order to ensure good clinical practice is really important. Uh, these global bioethics standards, including GCP, are also applied outside biomedical products in relation to so-called, or we'll called the medical devices. Now, this is interesting in itself because what we can see is that the uh, scope of, of, of what these standards apply to is far broader than the original intention. Just as a note, part of the reason for um, manufacturers of medical devices following ICH guidelines seems to be that actually ICH guidelines are something of a gold standard. Um, if they are followed, if these ICH guidelines are, are, are followed, it seems unlikely the medical devices won't meet um, uh, essential safety requirements um, uh, in, in, in different markets. Moreover, and, and, and here's, I think, the clear link to law, I've already mentioned this, these start, standards are applicable and de facto binding in ICH members, I mentioned some of those already, but also non-members, um, that uh, in, in, at least within members occurs to some extent in law, so uh, say the clinical trials regulation in the European Union, uh, that are uh, that, that will mention um, good clinical practice. There's more specific legislation at the EU level on good clinical practice and so on. So this is integrated within legal instruments. Uh, moreover, uh, the regulatory pathway towards market authorization for, for medicinal products has embedded within it these standards. Compliance with these standards is essentially a requirement to get um, to marketing, to get to licensing, and, and then sales can, can be made. The focus of my article, so I'll, I'll, I've got to it, uh, uh, the focus of my article and argument are as follows. I'm really interested in how expectations or strong beliefs about what can occur, so expectations, and the imaginary produced through those expectations flow from the ICH's mission and technological framing. I already put that up. I'm also interested in some of the implications of this for legitimation, that is to say in particular in terms of who and what are legitimised. I argue that expectations 
are a technique of public legitimation, not just legitimation, but more concretely, I suppose, or specifically public legitimation for the ICH and its standards, and also the regulators and laws that implement those standards. What do I mean by public here? Well, it can include stakeholders, might include non-ICH countries who can form, um, but um, wider publics, we might say. There's an assurance that comes through compliance with ICH standards that, uh, that well, those standards are met, that more, more particularly uh, medicinal products are of good quality, they're safe, uh, well, and they work, they're efficacious, they're effective. So, put this up again. So this is the, the logo for the ICH really. It's, it's quite a pretty logo, I suppose. Um, there's something of a, would one say, I'm not sure what, I can't see, quite, can't quite see you. No, I've, I've put you out of the way, haven't I? Minimized you, sorry. Um, uh, but um, if I were in a, in, a, in a room with you, I would ask you for your thoughts on this, um, on what you think. Um, I don't know if we can do that, really. It's probably going to complicate things too much. Um, so I'll speak to this and then perhaps um, just in Q&A, it's easier just to, if we want to talk about this a bit more. But I think this is a significant uh, logo. It does describe the mission. This mission, Armonisation for Better Health, is contained uh, or was found or can be found across the ICH's website, also more particular documents. So this isn't just superficial fluff. Um, it's actually, one might say, encoded, embedded, found within, uh, and helps to structure, orientate, uh, direct uh, ICH governance, the production of those standards, their take up and what I'm trying to say, um, I'll ultimately say, is that the expectations coming out of this uh, mission um, and technological framing and the imaginary that they produce actually operate as uh, a technique of legitimation. But there are some implications and downsides that we need to uh, reflect upon. So let me just talk about um, some of that in more detail. In particular, then I'm going to move from top right hand corner going clockwise, um, speaking to the first two uh, quarters here um, uh, directly, and then just outlining the final two quarters before moving to look at them in a bit more detail. So, this is harmonization for better health. That's right in the centre. Oh, actually, this is an interesting point. Um, Harmonisation here is spelt with an S deliberately. I do try and use S form spelling of words, but that's actually then, uh, you, you'll have seen it on, on the previous slide. Let me go, harmonisation for better health. So it's actually reflecting the S form spelling um, there. Now, I don't think that's an accident. Um, it, it could be um, that um, uh, there's an attempt here, an active attempt to avoid a Z form spelling, which I think sure is US spelling uh, or, 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 or tends to be a tendency in, in the US. Um, so it's interesting, I think, that S form spelling is used, but, but maybe that's reading too much into it. You know, just, just, just a note, but um, maybe a, a, an interesting one for further discussion. So starting top right hand corner. So I think that this uh, mission statement, um, also a technological framing, um, both supports and legitimates a focus on technological development. Well, you might think, of course it does, if it's a technological framing. Um, but more particularly, as I've already alluded, when we look, and if you were to look more at uh, the construction of ICH governance and at its standards, as I do in the article itself, we can see how this mission is implemented in such a way that it does really become focused on technological development. Um, it doesn't necessarily have to be, just because it says harmonisation for better health, that doesn't necessarily mean it's predestined as such, it will be focusing relentlessly on technological development. The word harmonization is dry and technical and, and goes in that direction. But better health may suggest something more than technological development. But as I'm trying to say, in short, 
what we see when looking at ICH governance, um, and in particular the standards that are produced, such as good clinical practice. The focus is on producing safe, effective and good quality pharmaceuticals. That is the focus. Now, in terms of legitimation, this uh, mission and technological frame, uh, framing has flown from it uh, expectations that and the imaginary then that they will be produced. Um, this output, safe, effective, quality pharmaceuticals. This, I think, and I argue in the paper, part, uh, legitimates the ICH. It's technological, I'm just putting it in brackets, that is to say risk-based governance and standards. And also the regulators and laws that implement those standards, that, that bring them to life really um, in different national or supranational constitutional legal orders. There's an implication of this though. The focus actually creates some limits, of course. When we when we have a focus, there are usually something, there's usually something of limits, some sort of boundary, and, and things that either lie on the boundary or are outside the boundary. This focus limits the boundaries of responsibility and accountability to the production of safe, quality and effective pharmaceuticals. But moreover, achieving this through individual ethical conduct. I've already mentioned uh, good clinical practice. So the focus there is on individual ethical conduct, both by individual clinicians, but also their organisations. Um, I, th I think putting it in these terms might help. Um, good clinical practice might be thought of um, to some extent as uh, providing some tick boxes. I'm not saying it's necessarily purely a tick box exercise, but providing some tick boxes um, that um, indicate when they have, that those boxes have been ticked, that that is here present or that there has been um, carried out uh, ethical conduct, that in ethical conduct is being adhered to. Moving on a little bit, um, going, um, well, it's, yeah, it's left here, isn't it? So it'll be your left as well. Um, this focus, so there's this focus then, it's marginalising, it's limiting the boundaries of responsibility and accountability to um, the production of those pharmaceuticals. But the focus actually also minim uh, marginalises wider systemic issues. So, um, social uh, the production of safe, quality, and effective pharmaceuticals is a question, to some extent at least, uh, of social justice. But there are lots of other social justice issues relating to pharmaceuticals that can't be reduced down to safe, quality, and effective pharmaceuticals. I'll come to those um, in a in a moment or two. Uh, we can see those in particular highlighted when we look um, to the global south. I'll explain why. And then finally, there's something else I'll turn to in the next slide and explain in a bit more detail. We can see being sidelined public participation in ICH governance. Now, this is important because public participation is an alternative technique of legitimation that's typically used at the national and subnational level, also at the supranational level um, in the EU, but at the, in the ICH, so this is at the global level, public participation is underdeveloped, and uh, I'm going to say more about that and why that matters and how it links up to these wider systemic issues and maybe trying to help to address those. I'm just wondering, I've got a bar at the top, um, I think. You'll all be able to see that. Is that right? Can I move the bar? Yes. <laughs> um, so I can see what I've said. Um, so the first point, so the ICH, ICH focus marginalises issues related to social justice, and particularly those um, affecting countries and people in the global south. So there's quite a lot here. Um, I like to put things, just put it there so you can read ahead if you like, or just have it to refer back to as I move on. Um, so the ICH's focus, um, does so, it marginalises these wider issues of social justice by essentially distorting our attention or the attention of publics um, or, or, or having that inadvertent um, effect, perhaps it's inadvertent, um, but directing um, attention and resources 
uh, towards the management of consequences through technical solutions, that is to say, through pharmaceutical responses. Now, this might seem a bit too much, um, but if we just refer it back to, um, or just think back to um, the ICH's mission, uh, its technological framing, harmonisation for better health. Better health is to be achieved through uh, pharmaceutical responses. So this is directing at, uh, attention towards, um, I think, in the main, or, or, or linking to a tendency um, for risk-based governance, which is what the ICH's governance is, um, towards that focus on, well, consequences, managing consequences. Here, through pharmaceutical responses, itself a, a technical solution. Here, moreover, expect the expectations flowing from that mission and the imaginary that, that's built mask what's going on, help to mask, by essentially providing legitimating cover. I think the COVID-19 pandemic underscores how this may operate. And here I'm saying things quite briefly, missing out nuance. So I just want to acknowledge that. But I think it still provides a good example and hopefully I can do it justice in these few minutes. In relation to the COVID-19 pandemic, as we've all seen, uh, wider social conditions that caused the virus spread actually seem pretty marginal. They have been highlighted from time to time. For instance, here in the UK, it's been highlighted that there are certain areas where the uh, spread of the virus, the, the rates of infection and so on, uh, rates of deaths indeed, um, and long-term uh, consequences, long-term um, uh, long COVID, for instance, the effects of, of infection um, seem to be linked to uh, overcrowding. Um, uh, and in particular, um, poverty. So areas of so social deprivation. I, I live in Northern Ireland and I'm coming to you, um, uh, it was highlighted right at the start from, from Belfast. Um, and here in Northern Ireland, um, actually, it's sometimes been that the instant rate, and actually I think it could be wrong, could be wrong, I don't think so. Um, but uh, I've been struck a few times by how the instant rate uh, the impact of the pandemic seems to be worse, greater, perhaps, is the best way to put it, um, in the west of, of Northern Ireland. And that's actually an area where um, there's historic deprivation, deep social deprivation, um, and a lot of effort to try and address it. But still, there seems to be um, correlation, at least, um, between areas of social deprivation and um, the uh, instance of COVID-19 and the impact of COVID-19. Um, so I think we've seen, I'm, I'm um, labouring this point a bit too much perhaps, that wider social conditions that cause the virus's spread seem pretty marginal. We as individuals, as uh, societies and our governments and our authorities have been focused on dealing with the virus, um, managing the virus and the consequences of the virus's spread, trying to limit its spread. Now, I think that um, the COVID-19 pandemic, and I talk about this a bit more in, in the article, not least because the ICH done, has done some regulatory work to try and facilitate um, production, speedy production um, and availability of vaccines. Um, this is a good case study, I think, because this distortion of priorities may actually undermine the social infrastructure. So focusing on just dealing with consequences may undermine the very social infrastructures that are needed to address all public health problems. So COVID-19, other um, communicable diseases, but also non-communicable diseases and conditions, other public health problems. These social infrastructures may actually be cheaper, more effective and beneficial than some of the responses um, I want, want to be careful here, I'll tell you why in a moment if I remember, um, but they may be cheaper, more effective and benef beneficial than simply dealing with consequences. Now that isn't to say, and here's my clarification, that we shouldn't be dealing with consequences, but if we actually had in place or dealt with a bit more um, keenly and comprehensively um, the um, social causes of uh, disease, of conditions, um, that have facilitated, so far as we can tell, the spread of, say, COVID-19, um, society as a whole uh, may have been uh, impacted less um, by this pandemic. Now, this 
it, do, it does all link um, to the ICH because the ICH is interested in producing to uh, pharmaceuticals, which, as I've said, can di uh, direct attention towards um, or augment um, this focus on consequences that we see. Um, a further point to note is the link between uh, the ICH and intellectual property. So I'm, I'm again just sketching over, uh, sketching this quite lightly and, and um, uh, probably ro robbing this of, of nuance. But the agreement on trade related aspects of intellectual property, FIPS for short, provides all technologies, including medicines and vaccines, are patentable, patentable in all World Trade Organization states, that is to say globally. So the patent holder, usually but not always, the marketer, is able to prevent generic equivalents from entering the market for duration of the patent grant. That's 20 years. Patents provide market exclusivity. ICH standards provide a key basis for marketing and benefiting from exclusivity. So patents, OK, they're one thing. They do provide for exclusivity, but to actually benefit um, from marketing, there needs to be compliance with ICH standards. Can't really say too much about this in, in the time available, which I shall just check. Oh, I'm probably running over a little bit, sorry. Um, but um, what we can see here, I think, um, is that there is a link between patents and ICH standards and consequences um, for the way in which they work together for access to medicines, um, especially in the global south. And I do say more about that um, in my article, in the article itself. I'm just aware of time. Sorry, I, I said this would be 30 minutes, but uh, sorry about that. Um, now, the next thing I want to say, and then I believe I conclude, is um, in relation to public participation. And this really helps to bring everything together. So the focus then um, is in that ICH governance, very much on producing harmonisation uh, for better health. I've explained some of the consequences of that focus um, and how, though that is masked by uh, expectations and an imaginary that uh, legitimate the ICH, its governance, um, its standards and their uptake by regulators and, and, and embedding in law. Public participation is something that's actually sidelined. This is despite reforms in ICH governance, um, in particular since 2015, when the ICH became an international association under Swiss law, and there were introduced reforms in relation to transparency and, um, well, vested, it seems um, some of the trappings of, of dem democratic input, like an assembly, there's the ICH assembly. However, these don't compare favourably with uh, uh, innovations at, say, the EU level of governance, seen in relation to, for instance, the European Medicines Agency. Um, and here, if this works, I think I need to click. Ah, sorry, I have to use my mouth. Um, this takes me on. Now, I think it's in relation to public participation um, as an underused technique of participation. No, pardon me. It's in relation to public particip participation as an underused technique of legitimation, lots of long words, um, that it might become possible. Attention to public participation provides an opportunity to deal with some of those issues relating to social justice, to draw attention to them, to maybe deal with them, um, to improve uh, legitimation overall at the ICH level. SGS, so Science and Technology Studies, points to the potential of public participation. In particular, SGS, uh, it's, it's the, I mean, there's a lot written on this, so I'm summarising it, um, but SGS uh, makes the claim, I think very persuasively, and I've built upon it in my own work, to say that public participation or publics can contribute towards an, uh, can contribute their views towards framing of risk, so what counts as risk at all, um, questions relating to who benefits and experiences harm, and also how we might know these. The European Medicine Agency seems to take this sort of thinking very seriously, 
it's not to say it's perfect, but there have been innovations in the European Medicines Agency. Um, and in the uh, article that I'm speaking to this evening, I've argued, reflecting on uh, STS discussion and also innovations at the uh, EU level in the European Medicines Agency for increased public participation in the ICH to enhance transparency, to improve the quality, safety and efficacy of pharmaceuticals through an input of, um, of more knowledge, more expertise, experience. Um, to widen the focus, potentially to include other social uh, justice issues so that the ones I've noted can be drawn to attention, may be ameliorated as problems, but also to further bolster legitimation. So public participation as a technique of legitimation could be improved. This would in turn then supplement reliance on the current main technique of legitimation. Um, that is to say, communication of expectations and transparency to demonstrate that practices are in accordance with, with them, i.e. the expectations. So things in a sense come full circle. By looking at imaginaries, uh, expectations and how they produce imaginaries, um, how they flow from uh, the ICH's mission statement, harmonisation for public health, it becomes possible to see uh, how there is generated a particular technique of legitimation. Some of the implications for this in terms of the issues that are sidelined, marginalised, masked, but also what else is neglected in terms of another technique of participation, public, uh, sorry, another technique of legitimation, public participation, and how it is possible to develop that further to attend to some of those uh, problems um, at, at, as I've highlighted. So this is the conclusion. I think I've really just summarised um, that in, in, in what I've just said. Um, I will stop now. <laughs> That's, um, I, I went well over time. I do uh, or over what I'd intended. So I, I do apologise, Jane. I can't, I can't see you all now. I don't know how to bring you back. Um, how do I bring you all back? I minimised you. Um, but I'm sorry for going over time. I'm sorry to everyone else. <laughs> I didn't really. Oh, no, no. That was really interesting. I think what you have to do is just oh, press yes. on the green yeah. button so you don't share your screen anymore. Oh, yes. Stop sharing. Stop sharing. There we are. Now we've got you back. <laughs> Thanks for your patience, everyone. Um, that that was so interesting and um i just love the way that you managed to put some really complex ideas together and really give us insights into how the decision making of these bodies and it's it's very interesting to focus there's a number of bodies like that and you start to um what you have given us as a number of tools for unpacking what they're doing and the effect of what they're doing. And, and I, for one, it's really sort of helped my thinking. I'm going to see, are there any questions from the floor? Have people got any questions that they'd like to ask? Michael. Thank you. Uh, uh, so uh, apologies to anyone else who had their hand up. I'm not seeing anyone on, on my screen at the minute. But um, so thanks, Mark, for a really interesting talk. Um, I, I really enjoyed that. Obviously, I have an interest myself in in expectations and imaginaries mm -hmm. from from the STS point of view. So I, I was just wondering, I had, a, I had sort of a linked question. I was thinking one of the things that came to mind when you were talking was in in kind of STS debates, the idea that discussions around technological performance often center on the, you know, the very technical, the very detailed, and that is used as a way to kind of exclude um, publics and sort of people who may be affected by technologies and, and users from those debates by saying, well, this is really a matter for experts. And I was wondering whether you see a parallel on the legal side in terms of whether the technicality of law of standards thing can also be used to create an expectation as it were that, that other voices are not welcome or not appropriate for that and whether 
lawyers or academics working in social legal studies or anything like that have a role to play maybe in trying to help open up those spaces and and show how some of those technical debates can be made accessible to wider public discussions? That's a really good question. Uh, it, it links very uh, nicely to the larger project I'm trying to develop on, on facilitating dialogue between law and, and STS. And I've been in touch with a few people. I think it actually, we were in touch, Michael. <laughs> <laughs> so, I haven't really, quite got back to you yet, so I guess. No, so. well, I, it's on the back burner, actually, so, yeah. um, because I've, you know, there's always something else, and it's something that it's going to take time to develop anyway. Anyway, um, that's from another time. But no, very good question, and thank you so much for engaging with what I have to say constructively and, and taking what I've had to say and, you know, forward and, into a question. Um, most definitely, I, I see how um, what you, you've described in STS, um, so I might get, actually no. Let me just clarify because I, I'm wondering if, in relation to STS, so STS scholars, a lot of them, or not maybe not a lot of them, but there's a lot of discussion on public participation in STS, and they draw attention yeah. how the technical can, or attention to the technical can shut down space or seem to. Although you know they critique that and say, well, actually, it, it, it you know there's normative in the technical, there's mm. content there that actually. Um, publics or citizens can engage with, can contribute, um, thinking on. Um, but I, did you say then, or was part of what you were saying, that actually some STS work does actually exclude participation, or, or are they just throwing it mm. out? No, I, I was I was trying to say, so, I mean, really, to, what, what you were saying, that STS work has shown how is a normative content in a lot of these technical discussions that publics could potentially engage with but the way that things are presented as technical matters as expert matters in itself creates an expectation that there's no room for the public there creates a yeah. presumption that you know this is not something where you as a, a lay person or you as a technology user but not a technology yeah. developer should have you know, there's a normative it has its own normative way of saying this is not the place for you we yeah. and yeah. then you use it and that's all you need to do I go away yes exactly yeah and I was wondering whether you see something similar on the legal side um, around uh, you know legal expertise potentially and standard setting having a similar effect Indeed. Well, I, I mean, this, the way I see it is that law and technology, they're imbric they imbricate, right? So there are overlaps there. And I think, uh, moreover, then, there's the interaction um, between the two. And actually, they're not even necessarily separate, right? Um, it's more than imbrication, there's entanglement. Uh, so um it's depending on how we think of it i do think of things as more entangled but sometimes it's just needed to say maybe implications to keep the separation right um but i, I think th there's something bigger here which is um i i, I yes I, I agree um with what you say about technology i agree i i, I agree then um with what you say i or it's, i see what you've said in relation to technology being present in relation to the way law operates um, yes, absolutely. Um, also regulation. Um, but I think there's something more to say, which is within law as a discipline and within, uh, so within that, the, the doc doctrinal work, I, I was talking um, right at the start of this meeting, kind of making a joke about my place within law schools, but there's doctrinal lawyers, as, as I guess everyone here are, is acquainted with. Um, there, there are, you know, it's a real divide in many law schools between doctrinal lawyers and socio-legal lawyers and uh, uh, maybe other kinds um, that I feel sometimes quite acutely. Um, but I think what I see within um, uh, law as a discipline, although there are some exceptions and they tend to be uh, from people within or, or may describe themselves as more socio-legal, that there tends to be um, maybe this might be too strong, but I'll say it anyway, uh, because I've I've just um, provided the qualification. But I think there's a bit of ignorance around these issues, actually. I mean, I mean, those working in law and technology, maybe they're, they're not. Um, but the, the importance of 
say what publics or citizens, whatever we want to call them, have to say what they might contribute, does tend to be downgraded or not even thought of as a central issue. Um, whereas I personally think it, it is um, pretty central, maybe not the central issues, there are lots of issues, but my, my view is that um, people who may be, there may be users, um, of course there's lots of discussion, you know, in, in relation to um, technologies and, and I, I think you're the people to speak to about that and you could speak on that more than, than I can. But um, for me, um, the people affected by um, science and technology are some of those who need to be more centrally involved in setting agendas from the get-go uh, in thinking very much more about, well, what are the expectations that we have of science and technology? And of course, this is all very, uh, very taken for granted in, in much STS work and some other disciplines, but it's not so central in law um, as far as I can tell. And I find that very frustrating. Um, there's lots of criticism or, or um, there's lots of questions asked around, well, why, why even talk about this? Um, why not just talk about the law? Well, it's like, well, actually, um, <laughs> there's more to talk about here. Like, who's the law um, empowering or disempowering? Um, why is the law so complicated in a particular area? Why do some um, uh, like, uh, things that lawyers do seem to exclude people needlessly, um, it seems? Um, and there is recognition of, of some of this in some areas. Um, I'm thinking, this is re remote from what we're talking about, but say family law, I mean, the setup of courtrooms, I mean, that's much discussed in family law. And of course, you know, in, in children's cases, also medical, you know, for anything to do with children. Um, but um, yeah, apart from those, those particular areas, um, yeah. Uh, anyway, I'm, I'm trying to say that I think there's a bigger issue to do with limits in the mind of lawyers um, and those working in law. Um, so, yeah, thank you. OK, thanks, Mark. I, I think, Jim, yeah, you may. Unfortunately, Matt, I have to go. But um, I just wanted to thank you very much for a really inspiring talk. And it's enabled me to put various things together in my head. And I certainly want to come back to you um, about them. Um, if people want to stay on and ask questions, they certainly can. Um, uh, but I have to go, unfortunately, now. So um, thank you so much, Mark, and great to see everybody here. OK, take care. Bye. Thanks, Bye. Jim. Thanks, Jim. I'll hang around. Yeah, so I mean, I, I'm happy to kind of uh, MC and see if there are any uh, questions. I can see who's got their hands raised. So yeah, if anyone just either just turn your screen on and, or just put the use the little hand icon, the reactions button or puts, uh, I guess if you put something in the chat, I can get that. Uh, otherwise, um, so I mean, I'm, yeah, I'm not sure if there's any, other, I'm not seeing anyone coming through with That's any okay. other questions at the minute. Um, but yeah, I mean, I think I just want to echo uh, Jane and, and really thank you for coming on and giving this talk and I think from my point of view it's very interesting to see more development of kind of I guess work around futures and expectations in in the law because um, obviously being an STS person working in a law department that's <laughs> that, uh, that that's really interesting to me. <laughs> yeah I imagine it's quite an uncomfortable position sometimes maybe I don't know. I mean, I, I think really, do. I mean, it's, I haven't, it's not too bad. I think I, you know, because I, I get, I can't really answer questions about doctrinal law because that's my expertise. So it's more, I think things, we tend to just bypass each other rather than getting into very difficult arguments just because I don't yeah. know about those other parts of the law to really debate that and, and you know, um, I think we'll see, we'll see what happens, you know, as, as kind of Helix gets more embedded in the, in the faculty. Um, yeah, well, I, I'll take any question at all um, on anything that I've said, really. Um, if it's just something more um, about the nature of being a scholar, even, you know, um, you know, the scholarly pursuits or, or, I don't know, um, or, or what's the point of interdisciplinary work? I mean, 
hopefully I've made the case for interdisciplinary work this evening. I mean, yeah, if anyone has any thoughts on that, just use the little reaction tool. Um, I mean, I get, I mean, I suppose one obvious question would be what do you think, how much do you think interdisciplinary work can achieve things that, that actually have an impact in people who are more disciplinarily focused? In other words, people who see themselves, you know, very much, you know, whether it's, and this is not just a question for law, but you know, what, you know, what can sort of a, what can what can a collaboration between law and STS bring? I suppose either to people who who you know within a law faculty who maybe don't really think about sociology and science technology studies, but maybe also what what can it bring to STS scholars? What's the other side? Because we're you know, STS is one of those areas where we are keen to get involved in other people's business and kind of cross fertilize and so we've had these really interesting ideas yes back the other way yeah well that's i was i was speaking to that point um in my previous talk so okay. I, I think <laughs> did I, to, to let you know i was speaking I, I think i did at the start of this i was speaking at durham um earlier and this afternoon and um not literally there i'm, I'm, I'm in belfast i haven't teleported backwards and forwards um but um no that relates very much to what i was talking about earlier uh, mm -hmm. what could this what could interdisciplinary exchange between law and sts bring to sts well in the paper I was giving earlier, and it, it, it kind of a little bit has come through in, in what I've been speaking to this evening. So I've really been focusing on one particular yeah. article this evening and trying to say, well, look, um, I can borrow from STS this concept of imaginaries. I understand them as, um, I said, well, like, linking to expectations uh, as being produced through expectations. We can put the concept to work to create um, a space to illuminate some things that maybe aren't so well lit, um, you know, put under the spotlight yeah. perhaps, um, put to one side and um, to actually then also uh, in highlighting these things as problems, mm. as solutions. Mm. So the way I see it, and this, I, I'm aware, of course, of some STS work that actually is solution oriented, is normative, is prescriptive, but generally, um, and those examples I have to say that I'm aware of, those prescriptions uh, or solutions tend to be pretty slim. <laughs> Uh, you know, kind of um, a bit sketchy, like yeah. and broad contours and so on. Yeah. And we can discuss that more perhaps another time. Um, but uh, I think the general tendency in STS, it's a field, of course, right? Rather than a single mm. I understand it. Um, uh, drawing, you know, a bit of a magpie, perhaps, um, STS. Yep. Also, kind of magpie tendencies um but i think that broadly speaking uh sts on the social sciences mm -hmm. with describing phenomena yeah. then uh providing for prescriptions or normative work um solutions i think that's yeah. what law tries mm -hmm. to do or, or legal scholarship so we have it's, it's embedded in in legal thinking so mm -hmm. we have a legal issue what's the law related to this apply the law reach a solution reach a conclusion right yeah it's, it's taught from day one at law school all the way to level three and postgrad and beyond um it's just very entrenched it's what courts do yeah <laughs> so, um so um solution orientation or solution or orientation towards solutions towards doing something to resolve problem is part of law yeah. um, now of course there's some legal scholarship that's very much to do and also sts scholarship that's uh, uh, provide critique there's some um, critique and uh, some kind of an in, in inflection within sts work but still i think broadly speaking we've got law um, normative, prescriptive, solution-oriented, yeah. STS, really about describing phenomena. Um, they're coming from different places in terms mm. of ontology, epistemology, methodology, um, yeah. their mind, of course. And 
I think it's about trying to say, well, you know, bring the two together. <laughs> there is something productive there. What I've tried to do with this um, uh, in, in this afternoon is to say, well, I can borrow a concept from STS, imaginary, try and do some what I think of as law work. I've tried to justify it as law work. Hopefully, yeah. a few. <laughs> some lawyers they they wouldn't be so convinced, but I'm fine with that. I'm 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 yeah. okay with that. And um I what I look at is as far as I'm concerned, part of what helps to bring the law to life, to legitimate mm -hmm. And not just law, but what it's part of, what's integrated within regulatory processes. Um, but as I've said, um, there are problems that arise, concerns that are generated um, in terms of what's sidelined as, as central, um, um, social just wider social justice, yeah. as I've said. Um, also, though, we see marginalised um, something called public yeah. participation, which is actually a, a good way to try and uh, highlight those wider yeah. social <laughs> social justice yeah. issues um, and um, that's my prescription that's my solution mm. for problems um, the marginalization of social justice issues that I've highlighted so that I think folds back into or comes back into mm. discussion with STS to say well look yeah using a concept that you guys champ you guys <laughs> you know, a champion <laughs> Um, I mean, there's a lot of championing, I think, of, of concepts in SDS. I think I see that more strongly than in law, actually. Um, so, um, championing, I don't know why that is, but it's like, oh, we've got this concept, it's so important, and blah, blah, you know, and yes. lots of good selling of it. Um, but then, from my point of view, it's like, well, okay, so what? Well, what mm. do we then do? What's the way yes. highlighted? Maybe a problem, but then what's the solution? Um, so that's where I think law can contribute. Mm. So that's a long way of response, Michael. No, but that's I mean that's that's really interesting because I, I think you're very right. You know, STS has a you know it, it doesn't have one origin, but it draws a lot on sociology and anthropology. Mm. They do tend to be descriptive fields much more than they tend That's to be. Yeah, yeah. You'll be normative fields. So yes, there is sometimes that. You know, SCS describes has a good critique, and I'll say here, mm -hmm. but then it kind of peters off, and you were sort of saying, um, we should do something. Mm -hmm. that, that's really interesting. Mm -hmm. that way of kind of bringing the two things together. Um, yeah, I think so, I, um, and, and and what I'm putting forward is so uh, this is really coming from a law position, and I suppose mm -hmm. with like, deliberately saying about talking about law led dialogue. I think it's done. I, I think I'm I'm just thinking about this right. Mm -hmm. now. Yeah. This, but I think strategically it's important in, in, in order to enroll lawyers and mm. associated yeah. scholars, it's important to, to enroll them in this sort of interdisciplinary exchange to say, well, um, law led work is what we need um, because here's what mm. contributes towards STS. Yeah. Uh, but that does also, I mean, I mean, the bigger picture here is the place of law. Uh, legal, socio-legal studies mm. in the the broader like mm. field of, of knowledge, right? All these different disciplines, a lot of them actually do encroach on what we lawyers might think of as legal territory. Mm. And lawyers are less good at communicating to those other disciplines about actually what lawyers do, what we're interested in. And so part of it Part of what I'm trying to think about next is how to improve how lawyers communicate um, and can engage with these other disciplines. Um, one thing I didn't highlight, I don't think, in today's talk is Bruno Latour. Um, and, um, he's, I've got the book there, it's, I've got a stack of books here, um, you can't see, um, and that's as well. Um, it's called, uh, the book, um, An Inquiry into Modes of Existence, which you probably mm -hmm. think of. I, I, I don't like all of his work, but I mean, mm -hmm. His, um, I, I do like all of it. Some of it's a bit too complicated. I lose the thread. Yeah. But you see, this is um, this is very much law. Oh, okay, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. But then an inquiry into modes of existence is more metaphysical. I yeah. think more like anthropological. Um, mm. What one would say, um, and um, but in, in modes of existence, Latour speaks of law as a mode of existence. It's very distinct. Okay. Um, even if. Perhaps um, lawyers aren't very good at defining it, and others perhaps aren't too well, <laughs> uh, you know, inclined to define it either. But we can see that it is a mode of existence, and there are all these other modes. And actually, the scientific mode of existence tends to colonise all the other ones increasingly, right? I think we all see that. Um, 
and um, uh, it's like this idea we can apply scientific method everywhere, you know, yeah, like, yeah. onto the ways of knowing, valuing, or whatever. Um, and um, but he's he, Latour is like, well, it's important for the modes of existence to speak to each other. That's that's what mm. from him. Okay, um, yeah, yeah, well, that's, that's a, yeah, I think that's that, yeah, that's definitely a good jumping off point. Um, I mean, there's a, there's a lot more things I could say, but I think uh, I, I think I should draw things to a close. Okay. <laughs> and let you go, um, because I've had a fat time though. I really have. Um, well, I mean, yeah. Thank you know. Hopefully, at some point in the future, we will actually be able to have some in-person seminars. We're not quite there yet, but you know, it'd be. Uh, we're hoping to get back to that. Um, probably not next year but maybe maybe 2023 we'll see what happens gosh it's crazy really isn't it that's that. time has oh, gone thank you so much are you willing to accept emails if people think of questions later after they've had yeah. time to reflect me is that yeah. I think, yeah yeah sure absolutely I'd, I'd love emails you know and if there's anyone that can attend them they've got any thoughts um then and please get in touch and also uh, I, I might as well say so um uh, to Michael um, in particular, but anyone here or as part of uh, Centre, if, the, if they're interested in, in, in getting involved in debate uh, or dialogue, as I'm calling it, between law and STS, law-led dialogue, no less. So it's very much law-led, uh, at least at the moment, but um, at least, di well, dialogue between law and STS, let's say, so I'm not finding people off. Um, um, please just get in touch because I'm really interested in trying to develop that. I'm really, you know, really just trying to think in a deep way about how to facilitate exchange between law and STS, you know, really in a deep way, you know, um, because there's a lot to do, and I, but I think it could be really productive. Excellent. Well, thank you again, Mark, and thanks everyone uh, for coming along. Um, I realise people have already left. Some people had to go, so they. they yeah, but uh, thank you all. Thank you so much for the invitation, and I, I wish you all a lovely evening. Thank you very much. <laughs> thank you. Well, I'll let Take you know care. when it's available on the podcast. <laughs> Oh, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> Bye. 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 Bye.